So hello and welcome to the Chrysphere Pavilion. My name is Thomas Frank. I'm a PhD candidate in glaciology at Uppsala University, Sweden. Today we have our session here on uh, indigenous knowledge and Chrysphere science. And I welcome all of you watching here, but also the ones watching virtually, including in our hubs in Stockholm and Geneva. So I'll hand off now to Tiana Carter, who is a policy officer from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in New Zealand. Welcome. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. E ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā rauranga tira mā. Uh, ngā mehi mai oha kia koutou katoa, kua huhu mai e te rānei uh, ki te whakarongo ki tēnei whakāturanga. Uh, no mai hara mai. Uh, ko whakatere me maunga ki e ki e ngā maunga, ko waima te awa, ko te waitimata te moana, uh, ko tuhirangi me o rākei ngā marae, ko ngā, fatu, ngā pohi me ngā te whātua, ngā iwi. Uh, greetings to you all from Glasgow and thank you all for joining us uh, today in person um, and online. My name is Tiana Kata. Um, I'm of Māori descent, uh, the indigenous peoples of Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and my tribes are Ngāpuhi and Ngāti Whātua. I am also a policy officer, as, as Tom said. Um, working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade New Zealand, and I am extremely privileged to be co-hosting this event today, um, talking about indigenous climate adaptation and mitigation, uh, particularly the responses from Alaska and Tokelau, um, alongside Kelly Moneymaker. Uh, I will pass the floor over to her now to introduce herself. Thank you. Thank you, Tiana. 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 My name is Kelly Moneymaker. Kelly Moneymaker. My father is of Anupiaq and German descent, whose ancestors are from Nome on the Seward Peninsula of Western Alaska. My mother is Samoan, whose ancestors hail from the village of Nuuli from the Tongo family. My great grandmother was a Tongo princess, and my grandfather, my grandmother, was from Leo to My last name, Moneymaker, is directly translated from Geltmacher. The moniker of my German grandfather's ancestors who worked at the mint printing money. I was born on the unceded territory of the lower Tanana Dene people. I currently live, work, and study in Oteoroa on Maori lands of the Nai Tara Iwi. I honor the traditional and ongoing stewardship of all indigenous peoples with a commitment to respectfully working in close cooperation. I'd like to recognize the Gaelic peoples of Scotland on whose land, traditional lands this event is being hosted. I'm currently earning a master's of creative enterprise degree at Massey University with a focus on indigenous media. I feel the combined use of indigenous knowledge and modern technology are the key to solving the climate change. On behalf of Massey University and Tiana and myself, I'd like to thank Pam Pearson, Dr. Heidi Sylvester and Amy M. Dyke of ICCI for this opportunity and for your hospitality. Thank you to the indigenous peoples of Tokelau and Alaska for sharing your wealth of knowledge and entrusting your stories to my team members. Tom Trainer, Dennis Davis, Gabriel Derrick, and Philip Blanchett. Thank you, Paula Fiva at MyCore and Anna Broadhurst at MFAT, Simone Gabriel, John He, and Bridget Johnson at Massey University. <laughs> Sorry, there's an echo. <laughs> I'm more than grateful. Um, I'm more than grateful. The words can possibly express for your support and contributions. And finally, thank you to all of you for engaging with us. I'll turn it back to you, Tiana. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. Um, so, thank you, Kelly. Today, we will be talking about. Um, Today we will be looking at indigenous climate adaptation um, and mitigation from both hemispheres with responses from Alaska and Tokelau. Um, the event will include a showing of award-winning short documentary, Vaka, um, about Tokelau's resilience um, and solution-based approach to climate change-related storm surges, and the pr premiere of Drum Song, The Rhythm of Life, a documentary trailer and featured clip which explores indigenous climate adaptation across Alaska as communities respond to melting glaciers, permafrost, and sea ice. 
Um, if we have some time at the end, we will pick up a quick Q and A. Um, so thank you. Uh, now, what I would like to do is introduce Puala Lele Penehuro Pene Lefale. He is the director of LEA International, specialising in disaster risk reduction and climate change. His acclaimed career as an international climate science and policy analyst introduced, includes work with the New Zealand Meteorological um, Service, Samoan Meteorological Service, the World Meteorological Organization, the Secretariat of the Pacific Environment Program, um, National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research of New Zealand, and the Meteorological, Meteorological Service of New Zealand. He was the lead author of, author of the Small Islands Chapter, uh, Working Group 2 on the IPCC Fourth Assessment for Report, which con contributed to the IPCC's award of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Pene is also the Climate Advisor for the Government of Tokelau's Ministry of Oceans, Climate and Resilience. Um, please join me in warmly welcoming Penehuru Lafale, who will be introducing VACA. Thank you, Pene. Oh, thank you, uh, Tiana. Kia ora tato, maloni, kite mamalu, heke heke kua aufione. Ulu tonu mai, whakahau tonu mai, nofo tonu mai. Good morning to you all and hello to those watching this event online. It's a great honor and privilege to be here today on behalf of the Ulu of Tokelau, Honor Paul Kelisiano Kalolo, also Minister of Climate, Oceans and Resilience, and the government and people of Tokelau at this event. The stakes of the outcome of COP26 are higher than ever, and decisions we make here in Glasgow have profound implications worldwide, regardless of who or where we come from. This event will present indigenous communities' climate actions at the local level to address global climate change. Note the word global, um, because no one country can be able to solve the climate crisis. The Vaka or Canoe in Tokelauan and also in Polynesian documentary is Tokelau and on the Vaka are their tupuna or ancestors, their mothers and fathers, their children and future generations. Their views are valued and they are part of the solution. So take your vodka now and let our journeys begin. The vodka is Takelau. And on this vaka are our tupuna, or ancestors, our grandparents, our mothers, our fathers, our children, our future generations. They are all on the vaka, and they all have a role to play. They have a contribution. Their view is valued, and they are part of the solution. is our ancestral home. We are a territory of New Zealand in the South Pacific. Our nearest neighbours are Samoa, 500 kilometres to the south, and Tuvalu, more than 1,000 kilometres to the west. We are a Pacific community leading by example to save our home for current and future generations. Supported by science, our neighbours and New Zealand we live and work together by our traditions. We strive to keep Takelau alive, thriving and healthy, now and long into the future.
So you can see that around it we live climate change. We are known as a New Zealand territory. But like Tonga, like Tuvalu, like Samoa, we have challenges that are different from New Zealand. So uh, that's why it's very important for us to have a say, to let the world that uh, we are living with this, uh, the impacts of climate change. Your Excellencies, recently I visited the remote atolls of Tokelau in the South Pacific. With a population of 1,500 people that is only accessible by boat, they have a story not often heard, but a message that must be shared. It's a message underscored by their new coastal walls, which are already toppling over as a result of the assault by the sea, and by the children who tell you they are worried about the future of their home. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a message of urgency. Um, and I, I, I'm asking myself about the issue of climate change. But at the moment, we can see a very big difference from the past up to now. Very, very hard for me to, to say how can I leave this, this island as a special one. Despite its small footprint, Tokelau is at the front line of climate change. And in particular in places like Tokelau, their, their emissions are tiny, but the impacts that they will see of the global emissions will be huge. So since the Industrial Revolution, we've actually um, almost, almost doubled, not quite doubled yet, you know, the carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere, and that's having a significant impact on our climate. As a global community, it's obvious that we need to make big effort to, to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. So in 2017, Tokelau endorsed its climate change strategy call living with change. To move these strategies forward, data is essential. This includes the creation of an inventory of Tokelau's greenhouse gas emissions. Through its mitigation strategy, Dokelo aims to further reduce its already low carbon emissions. Tokelo is really leading in terms of like trying to establish a realistic um, greenhouse gas uh, inventory. So after doing all the consultation with the villagers, going about identifying all the data that we required, we then put it into the um, testing out using the guidelines from the IPC to come up with Tokelau's greenhouse gas inventory. And of course, what we found is the energy sector, basically power, electricity generation, is by far the most critical one for Tokelau. Uh, Tokelau switched to solar power in 2012 and made the headline 
towards renewable energy. Dogelau does not sit back and wait for things to happen. The off-grid solar system there is perfectly suited for uh, you know, a small island like this. You know, it's, it's been a bit of a launching model for um, the rest of the Pacific Islands. Hence, they're putting them in everywhere, all over the Pacific now. Renowned for our success with solar energy, Tokelau is now transitioning to a hybrid system that combines both solar and wind generation. It's just a backup system. It's on a sunny day, you don't need it. But we do, believe it or not, we do get windy days and they do go on and on. I've forgotten that term. <laughs> I'll think of it shortly. It's islands in the wind here. <laughs> they don't call it islands in the wind for nothing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> As the climate crisis intensifies, so too does the likelihood of catastrophic weather events in the Pacific. To protect our people, Tokelau depends on reliable weather information. Tokelau aims to reduce and manage its climate risks while increasing resilience to natural disasters. AWS is, stands for Automatic Weather Station. The beauty of the Automatic Weather Station is you don't have to have a 24-7 you know, shift work to be able to monitor the climate and the, and the weather. Again, it's come down to data, data, data. Tropical data is critical to early warnings of any storm that will strike Tokelau. It's critical in terms of to enable people to prepare for the storm because we have no mountains to run to in terms of a tidal wave or a storm surge. We are very conscious of this issue because it's affecting our lives and our uh, future generations. When I grew up, there were small islands existed, but now you see nothing there. <laughs> Okay, <laughs>
Change compels people to move in ways that previous generations might never have imagined. In Tokelau, this means preparing ourselves to face an uncertain future while maintaining a connection with our culture and with the traditional customs of our people. We see the future, we rise for the children. That expresses resilience in terms of collectiveness. Our school here has been particularly um, strong in what we call context embedded learning, which is learning that looks at a real life context and then the students have the freedom to investigate what is the issue, how is it affecting us, who's being affected, what are the impacts, um, what's the cost and so forth. So I'll give you a specific example. One key um, context that the students looked at was how healthy is our reef? They learned that their reef is not healthy. Because of the carbon cycle, some of that carbon dioxide gets uh, dissolved in our oceans. The result of that absorption is that the ocean is actually becoming more acidic. So this is this process of ocean acidification uh, and it is quite alarming as well because even though the changes are relatively minor, the um, the ecosystems in our ocean are very sensitive to the level of acidity in the water. Corals are very sensitive to warm waters. And one, one interesting property of corals is that they form a symbiosis with an algae. And together, as a team, what they're able to do is be much more productive if the water temperature increases too far, it destabilizes the symbiosis between these two partners. And so when the algae is gone, the coral dies. It goes beyond just the physical structure, it's also all the fish that may eat the coral, that live on the coral. Um, it's all of the ecosystem services that coral reefs provide are then compromised because the corals really are the foundation. And uh, yeah, it, it can destabilize the ecosystem if too much coral death occurs. But the long-term goal is to reduce emissions so that corals can recover on their own. We can only benefit from working together and bringing cultural knowledge and, and scientific knowledge together as one, like long-term traditional cultural knowledge that can inform us about what the ecosystem was like before we started to affect it. So one of the solutions that the children posed because they were learning also from what's available on the internet was coral planting. The coral is pretty dead from this part to that part. Uh, horizontally and vertically it's pretty much not a healthy reef. And they bring their findings to the highest level of decision making in the village, which is the taupurenga. And in terms of their traditional knowledge, they know which parts of the reef are thriving.
decisions on protecting the, the corals and to ensure we had enough fish for food security because uh, fish is our main source of food in Tokelau. We heavily rely on fish to survive on this isolated uh, island. People must really, really be informed. They can have their own opinions, but they have to consider what the science is saying. It's not uh, a one person thing, it's a, it's a collective uh, responsibility for, for our children and for the, the whole world, I think. We come to realize, to strengthen our traditional knowledge, we need the science. And that is how we can work with the outside world. We are part of something bigger than Tokelau. Why are we doing it for what, what is the purpose? Do we hope to leave anything behind? For who? For a continued existence. It's important that we do these things. It's a legacy that was left behind. And it's our role to continue that, to create a safer place for our children and for those that are yet to come. The waka will get through all the rough seas. Our elders are at the stern. They will keep everything calm. The hatupai bai will provide and look after our young people. <laughs> The Aumanga, all the able-bodied, our church leaders, our teachers in the classroom. Every member of the community is looked after. The waka will have everyone on board. It is a collective responsibility. Yeah. 
Well, that was a very um, profound and inspiring documentary, and um, I, I really enjoyed that. That was um, very awesome to hear, learn more about the experience of Tokelau um, and the um, challenges that they face with, with adapting and, and mitigating um, climate change. Um, and also just it's it's the um, yeah really really awesome. So thank you all for for watching that today and and for joining us. Um, now I would like to change to our next uh, focus for this presentation. Um, so these images um, up on the screen here are from the Inupiat village of Shif Shishmaref on the close coast of Western Alaska, where they are experiencing the um, impacts of albedo loss due to melting glaciers, permafrost, and sea ice. Um, what we will go to now is Drum Song, The Rhythm of Life, which explores indigenous climate adaptation and mitigation across Alaska um, as communities respond to climate change, uh, to melting glaciers, permafrost, and sea ice. Uh, we're premiering the trailer for the upcoming film, as well as an interview excerpt from Ruth Miller and Marka Monture Paki of Native Movement in Alaska, who will provide who will who provide a land stewardship approach to mitigation. Awesome. Indigenous peoples of Alaska have followed a natural rhythm of life since time immemorial. We cannot be separated from the land, the sea, or other species. We are part of the ecology. The rhythm is changing. Glaciers, permafrost, and sea ice are melting due to climate change. Carbon emissions from extractive industries such as oil and gas exploration are driving temperatures in the Arctic and impacting the environment in ways our elders have never seen before. We are a living culture, embracing modern technology, yet we are deeply steeped in our indigenous knowledge. So we can survive, adapt, and thrive in one of the most extreme and beautiful places on Earth, Alaska. We will find a new rhythm. Follow the drum. And now we will go to the excerpt from the uh, documentary. Awesome, there we go. Okay. My name is Maka Munsur Paki. I am Tlingit in Mohawk and I grew up in Yakutat, Alaska. I was born into the Raven Moriti. My clan is from the Copper River. They're called the Gunnech Kwan or sometimes also the Kwashka Kwan because we migrated down the Copper River and settled in Yakutat and purchased Humpy Creek there. So we kind of go by both names. 
My family is the last line of the Owl House from Yakutat, and uh, my father is actually from Six Nations, so I'm Mohawk on my father's side. I also mentioned my maternal great-grandfather, so Te Khoidi is a bear clan of Inkland out of the Yakutat area. In the translation of my village, um, Yakutat, Yakutat is the place where the canoes rest, or a safe place for canoes to land. I have been advisor with Native Movement for a little while, but only this year have joined to help coordinate and produce for the Always Indigenous Media Project. And I also work with Data for Indigenous Justice and will be coordinating communications and storytelling on that side. Could you please state your name? A little bit about your community and your title, what you do. Plidu Shivaik Isinch Iji, Deni in a Kanaga Shalkun Kanash to Chakayang Asnanesh Ite, Shedaznaka Heather Kendall Miller Shunkta, to Uloid Miller Stukta, to Ukajne Vena Shakaya Kilanda, Dekaye Kak Shuguya Studa, to Chikinakali Kidiki, Yetel Hanun Bago Gyakli at Sete. Uh, my English name is Ruth Miller. My Dene'ina name is Shivaik Isan, which means whirlwind woman, and was gifted to me by my first language teacher. I am a Chakayang tribe of Dene'ina Athabaskan. I was raised here in Takaye Kak, uh, otherwise known as Anchorage, Alaska. And I am the Climate Justice Director for Native Movement, an indigenous matriarchal a nonprofit based here in Alaska, but operating uh, from the local community work uh, to nationwide and international advocacy. And additionally, I, I'd care to mention that I also claim my Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and welcome all of my ancestors into this space with us. You talked about Native movement, you talked about it being matriarchal in, in process, um, and I understand a lot of that work ties to climate. So for you, what or how would you define what climate justice is? Mm. Climate justice is about healing our relationship with our lands, our waters, and our bodies. Climate justice is fundamentally about reparative work, about re-entering relationships of reciprocity and deep and profound respect. While climate justice, of course, has to integrate climate science and addressing the issues of rising carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, while we're also advocating for the end to all fossil fuel extraction and, um, and non-renewable resource extraction that's desecrating our lands and poisoning our peoples, we know that what underlies that capitalistic exploitative approach to lands and waters is a colonial ideology that doesn't respect those lands and waters and doesn't respect the people who live from them. So our indigenous peoples living in rural communities, living with the lands and waters, loving them for millennia, being raised in generational knowledge that is rich with generations upon generations, thousands of years of climate observation and data collection and experimentation. Our indigenous communities are our leading climate scientists. And so when we integrate justice and a justice lens to climate science framework, we realize that we not only have to address the disproportionate impacts that frontline and environmental justice communities are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, the ways that people of color, low-income communities, uh, and particularly women and two-spirit relatives are being disproportionately impacted by the violence of climate chaos, we also have to remember that indigenous climate justice, matriarchal climate justice, charges us with healing work that is reparative, that is soulful, and that comes from the lands and waters themselves. That means not only addressing the ways that climate change is inequally impacting communities, but it also means turning to our indigenous and tribal leadership as sovereign native nations, supporting tribal sovereignty and land back efforts, but also turning humbly and asking teachings of our indigenous communities who carry generations of place-based knowledge that know the land better than anyone else. So when we consider climate justice, we have to consider interventions in popular climate dialogues, working with conservation and environmental groups, 
to reintegrate indigenous leadership and sovereignty into their frameworks, but it also means elevating indigenous stories from the land and giving our community members, particularly our elders and youth, the opportunity to share their experience of climate change and their solutions for climate change. This healing work means that we also have the opportunity and the responsibility to heal the violence that has been caused from colonization, from forced Christianity, from assimilation, and return to ways of life and ideologies that are restorative, that are good for us, that are focused on wellness and not just monetary wealth. So climate justice has to integrate racial justice. It has to integrate gender justice. It is returning to balance and a way of life that fundamentally um, respects the deep relationships between our indigenous peoples and all bodies with the lands and waters that we come from. You talked about decolonization um, in your work with Native Movement and how that has a role to play in police brutality and at other different levels in the organization. Could you share a little bit more about what you see as decolonization and in particular how that's implemented in the workshops that Native Movement mm -hmm. does? One compelling aspect of our advocacy at Native Movement is our decolonization workshops. But whenever I discuss decolonization, you also have to remember that's the first part. The second part is re-indigenization. So our decolonization workshops um, begin with the founding of this country um, and offer um, a truthful and holistic view of the ways in which white supremacy and racism were fundamentally integrated into the foundations of the American society and the U.S. government um, and the ways that that has been systemically implemented uh, throughout law and policy but also throughout social movements um, and by unsettling the dominant history that many of us are taught in public schools we begin to see opportunities for action. We take our um, training participants through a very holistic and complicated history of the founding of Alaska and the still illegal occupation of Alaska Native lands that our mm -hmm. people are suffering as well as the way that religion uh, in particular um, the church structure and missionaries was implemented to achieve colonization and assimilation but past that uh, we again provide tools and skill sets to our participants to not just unsettle the knowledges that they um, might have held previously, the unlearning process, but mm -hmm. also offer learning um, and offer opportunities um, for reframing as we build anew. And what that looks like is um, unsettling the kinds of white supremacy characteristics that many of us live with unknowingly. Um, and instead provide alternatives for how we can live in collaboration and in community with one another. So our decolonization workshops often last about five hours. They're integrative, experiential learning that provide an audience a safe space for um, for an education that they might not get anywhere else. Um, but Fundamentally, we hope to provide resources for new community building as well as we go through the stories of boarding schools and the ways that our languages and cultures and dances were taken from us. We also want to elevate indigenous solutions and opportunities for change and avenues for action that our participants can take to be in better alignment not only with our lands and waters, not only with our indigenous communities, but to be in better alignment with themselves as well. From what I hear, the decolonizing, decolonization workshops like dive in mm -hmm. and tell a true history that so many of our schools and so many of our public education doesn't include. Well, and this dominant and exclusive history is one that we're all consenting to until we have the courage to change it and to question it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand how vast and large Alaska is as well, mm -hmm. that each region has different specific histories, that there's communities where we never were actually conquered. Like in my village, we burned down the Russian fort, mm -hmm. and then suddenly we were American out of nowhere, and that these histories, I think, taking a place-based approach to decolonization and re-indigenization of true history, I think, mm -hmm. is powerful. I understand a lot of decolonization work to be tied towards the work of what is called just transition in Alaska. 
I understand it to be tied to the Alaska Climate Alliance. And in relation to that, President Biden has stated that his administration is committed to transitioning into a renewable and also a sustainable economy. How do you believe that we could light a fire under his administration to make that commitment true? When Just Transition came to Alaska, it didn't feel like us. And so when we were exposed to this framework, we went to our elders. Uh, we went to our elders in Lower Ten and Edine lands, and they offered us the phrase, Kocha Ethne, in the Benti Kanaga language, Kocha Ethne, remembering forward. Kocha Ethne, we remember. And this has become our framework for what Just Transition means. So just transition encompasses the shift um, from a, a militarized uh, democratic republic towards a governance structure of deep democracy that incorporates local leadership. Uh, it means moving from extractive, moving from resource extraction of non-renewable resources and towards regenerative and sustainable green resources. It means uh, seeing work not as something that can be exploited um, and instead work as something that can be cooperative and healing in and of itself. Um, it shifts us from consumerism and the colonial mindset and instead reminds us of caring and sacredness. This is what just transition is and this has been um, a touchstone for many of our community members and organizations to come together for because everyone has to participate in bringing us towards this regenerative economy. Towards that end, um, in the Late summer of 2020, the Alaska Climate Alliance began to coalesce, and that was an attempt by the climate movement across Alaska at large to come together and to map strategically how we can move uh, the tactics that we can manifest, the information that we can share as a climate movement across Alaska. But to me, fundamentally, one of the goals was to bring the conservation community into deeper alignment with indigenous sovereignty and to challenge them to uh, engage active allyship with indigenous peoples and to do decolonization work amongst themselves. Too often we see conservationists um, and environmental organizations defending the trees, but not the indigenous peoples that have caretaked for those trees for We're thousands of years. We're also trees, and <laughs> they don't understand that. Exactly. <laughs> the deep reciprocity and the relationship that exists between the environment and indigenous peoples is not just a sacred relationship, but it is a wealth of knowledge, place-based traditional ecological knowledge, and it is in and of itself the right to governance and mm -hmm. self-governance. Um, and so the Alaska Climate Alliance attempts uh, to bring uh, together the climate community under these indigenous principles of just transition um, and to promote collective movement towards a more liberated future. I remember telling a friend of mine that, you know, a United States political election is not going to get us to collective liberation, but it's not going to keep us from collective liberation either. So we remain eager to work with the Biden administration for real and permanent protections of our sacred lands and our resources. It is a challenge to bring an indigenous framework to fundamentally colonial systems of governance. Um, but we are a giving people and we are a compassionate people that are eager to share and eager to teach. And deep collaboration with the Biden administration could uh, reach so many, so many different agencies um, and, and lead to such bounty and justice for our peoples that have deserved justice for so long. Um, and so I believe that our communities, you know, stand by an open invitation to the Biden administration to come and learn from us, to come and share space from us, be in the smokehouse with us, go on a hunt with us, and understand what it means to care for land so deeply, to be so devoted to lands and waters that they are an extension of yourself, that you know who your ancestors are because you walk with them every single day. Um, you know, we have seen a huge myriad of efforts to reach the Biden administration. Um, 
first on my mind, of course, is the Justice 40 initiative by the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. Uh, we have a number of incredible indigenous leaders that are members to this committee, and we were very disappointed to see the way that their um, environmental justice recommendations and standards have seemed to be dismissed. And so as we advocate not just for our community members to be incorporated into these federal systems of uh, advisory committees and oversight, what it has to come down to is um, a deference of power. You have to be willing to give decision-making power to your advisory committees, otherwise they are far too easily ignored, and we see that nothing changes. Um, mm -hmm. And I would advocate vocally um, for not just increased representation from the Arctic, who's suffering the climate crisis at two to four times the rate as the rest of the world due to Arctic amplification, but to see deep decision-making processes be integrated with indigenous frameworks and indigenous voices. And so when we have an incredible piece of work like the Justice 40 initiative, now is the time to take that leadership from environmental justice leaders across this country and to implement their recommendations. We now have the the opportunity to incorporate those recommendations into the infrastructure bill that is sitting in Senate committee right now. And this opportunity means or could mean real change here on the ground. But there's only so much faith we can give before we need to see action taken. Could you share a little bit about the Always Indigenous Media series that was called uh, Living in Contradictions? Always Indigenous Media began as a ragtag team of citizen journalism uh, confronting the Alaska Federation of Natives and being extraordinarily dissatisfied with the way that oil interests and military interests were overrepresented over our Alaska Native community voices. So we decided to provide alternative media based in social media, based on Facebook and Instagram, mm -hmm. so that community members who were not able to attend in-person events at AFN were able to hear insights about what was happening, about the proceedings happening, but additionally to see alternative panels that felt and looked like us, that reflected our indigenous community. We held panels on gender justice, we held panels with Native veterans, we held panels with youth proposing uh, climate justice resolutions. Um, and this uh, became a really crucial way to pass the mic and to decolonize media uh, through increased accessibility. Always Indigenous Media went on to provide coverage of COP25 in Madrid, Spain, uh, incorporating a lot of different Indigenous youth voices to not only give insight and to share back home what was happening on the ground, um, but to deepen the engagement process so that more and more people can begin to break down these barriers of entry uh, to mm -hmm. these uh, generally inaccessible decision-making spaces like the COP25 and instead be able to you know turn on their phones, turn on their social media and access dialogues that were happening in real time. I think of the stories I grew up with. My, my grandfather was always a storyteller and after mm -hmm. dinner we'd sit at the table and he just would talk for hours <laughs> about his, his childhood and his experiences. Those stories follow a rhythm. Mm. And as indigenous people, we inherently move at a rhythm. We often in Tlingit culture say the first drumbeat we hear is our mother's heartbeat in the womb. And that's the rhythm that leads us. Do you feel that that type of rhythm has changed? You know, indigenous people follow a natural rhythm of their communities in life. Do you feel like that rhythm has changed? Many of our elders have always warned us that this time would be coming, that there would be a great reckoning. In our stories, we um, share uh, the experience of, of prophecy. And in each of our experiences, many of us have encountered elders warning us about what is to come, when the fish won't swim in the rivers and the berries won't ripen on the vine. That time is now. We are seeing unprecedented changes in our environments. We are seeing changes that we are struggling to adapt to. 
um, when the sea ice is no longer freezing in the same patterns and the same timing, we have nothing to protect our coastal communities from winter storms. We have nothing to prevent the communities from eroding into the sea. Uh, we have nothing to prevent the permafrost from melting underneath our houses um, and creating unstable terrain, uh, not to mention releasing additional uh, greenhouse gas emissions. When our berries are suddenly ripening uh, at different seasons and what our elders have always taught us, so many of us are at a loss. But our people have always adapted for millennia. We have always been innovators. We always have been contemporary peoples and we continue to be contemporary peoples. So as we ride these waves, uh, we should not fear uh, the changing of the waves. We should not fear learning these new rhythms. Um, but we should remember the ideologies that always brought us back to balance. We have stories of great glaciers across Alaska in times of, of severe scarcity, and still our people persevered. We are so deeply resilient into the fabric of our spirits, into our bones. Our DNA is fundamentally tied with this place and this place only, and it always will be. What we're being challenged with now is learning new rhythms and understanding the ways that we can take agency, we can take action in ensuring that those rhythms are harmonious with the rhythm, rhythms that we have always recognized. Just as with the waves on a shore or the moving tides, just as with our heartbeats, these rhythms might be challenged, but when you love something, you fight to protect it. When something changes and grows, you work to learn it anew. And we might be challenged soon with coming up with new words in our indigenous languages to describe the ecological shifts that are happening as a result of the climate crisis. But we also know that we have the fundamental teachings from millennia and millennia of perseverance and subsistence to guide us back into balance. It is those teachings from the past that will lead us into a holistic, a wellness-centered future, one that's based on cooperation and caring and compassion. Our indigenous life ways show us the way forward, and these rhythms will become ones that we recognize again. Spoken like a true whirlwind. <laughs> Absolutely. Oftentimes people ask me, you know, what, what advice would you give to young climate activists? Um, and I'm not going to tell anyone to fix their leaky faucet or to turn off their lights more often. This is a moment of deep urgency. Now is the time to deeply reflect on the fundamental ideology that grounds you and that guides your life. And if that is an ideology that's based on a distance from the land, that's based on a distance from our food sources, that's based on a, a, a consumerist mindset that relies on you know, monetary payment for the bare minimum of wellness, then we need to expand our thinking. And that applies to indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities alike. This is the time to be bold and to be courageous in the ways that we are willing to change and the ways that we must change to shift our perspective of land and our deep reciprocal relationship of land that has to come back to us before we see any decrease of this climate crisis, if such a thing is even possible. The ways that we enact justice in climate mitigation and climate adaptation strategies will fundamentally rely on indigenous wisdoms and place-based knowledge. They will have to take care of all communities of color, all low-income communities, all houseless communities. This must be a transition that caretakes for all people. And the only way that we will reach that is with community input. So don't just go vegan, don't just fix your leaky faucet or turn off your lights. Think about what your relationships look like now and think about how to tend to those relationships. The lands, the waters, they have not abandoned us. Our Athnena, our Milni, our Kaneshi, they have never left us. They continue to feed us. They continue to give us clean water to drink. And when that is jeopardized, we must fight for it as an act of ultimate gratitude as an act of reciprocity and to continue mm -hmm. being in right relationship with our first mother.
Thank you so much for watching that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, a few people who have pulled this project together and um, made, made it possible to be here at COP26 and, and showing this amazing um, work. So firstly, uh, Kelly Mani Imaka, who joined us at the start, was the project lead for this event, organised by uh, Massey University with support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade New Zealand and the Government of Tokelau's um, Ministry of Oceans, Climate and Resilience. Um, with contributions from the Indigenous peoples of Alaska and Tokelau. Um, Ruth Miller and Marka Monture Paki of Native Movement, who were un un unable to be here today, um, but are with us in spirit. Um, photography by Dennis Davis of Shishmaref, Alaska, and Ben Dickens of Aotearoa. Um, special thanks to Anna Broadhurst at MFAT, Paula Fayava and Penehuro Lefale um, from uh, my core, uh, Bridget Johnson, John He, and Simone Gabriel from Massey University. Um, and thank you very much to Pam, Amy, and Heidi from uh, ICCI. Uh, now we would like to we would like to um, pass it over to Kelly, um, and we will have a brief Q and A. Um, of 15 minutes or so if, if anyone has any questions regarding this um so please if you if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask um to kelly and and possibly penne as well um please join us on the mic and we will um yeah we will get your questions to kelly who will answer them thank you thank you tiana thank you so much <laughs> thank you <clears throat> <clears throat> A little bit of an echo from our in Kelly, just very brief. I think it's okay. Is it still there? Okay. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions for Kelly? Otherwise, uh, there may be some questions online if, if people are joining us online as well. No, no questions. <laughs> Any for Pene Horo? Mr. Pene Horo? Mr. Pene Horo? We've got someone here who would like to ask a question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this two very nice documentary. So I have a question. I find the second documentary in um, in Alaska. I'm wondering. It's not. I don't know if it's a very good political question here, but <laughs> I'm wondering if there is some program from internal, international cooperation, so for example in Alaska from USID, and how the indigenous people receive this program and what it's happening and if they are like in phase with this program or if there is some kind of, maybe they are not the best thing that they could be done there. Uh, if I understand the question right, right yes, the right, yes. Native Movement does native hold movement decolonization does hold courses for corporation, for corporation, for corporation, for corporation, for corporation. Uh, decolonization and also indigenization. Is any opportunity to connect into that process? Um, yes, um, they can email, email, email. email, email Email, email. Uh, you can go to their website, uh, website. Uh, it's www.nativemovement.com. Also, they could send an email to me, which my email address is C-H-A-C-H-I-N-G records, records, LLC, LLC, LLC at gmail.com. Gmail gmail and I will forward any information, forward any information directly to the Native Movement to connect you. Awesome. Thank you for that, Kelly. Um, yeah, I also you. have her email, Kelly's email here, um, so I'm happy to pass that on um, in person if that's if you didn't manage to catch the full um, address. So thank you so much for that, Kelly. Do we have thank any you. other questions um, that we would like to ask Kelly while, while she's joining us from um, New Zealand time? Or, or Penny as well, if Penny's happy to answer some questions about Tokelau's experience.
doesn't look like we've any got any questions in the room, Kelly. Um, I, I think uh, I, I can speak for my, my experience of, of watching Vaka and watching the um, drum song excerpt. It was it was very inspiring and very um, yeah, just very inspiring to to watch that the, those those sharing of experiences. And thank you so much for inviting me to to um, moderate this this um, side event today. And just really appreciate your um, your amazing ability to pull together these stories um, and and show them in a way that um, really resonates with with me as an Indigenous young person. So thank you so much for that for this opportunity as well. Oh, thank you so much. It's been my honor to work with Tokelauan and Alaskan Indigenous peoples uh, and grateful that they have tr entrusted my team with their stories. If anyone is interested in joining the mailing list or the premiere of the film once it's finished, please speak with Tiana and get my email from her if you'd like to join the mailing list. Our website will be going live for Drum Song Film shortly, but until then, uh, get the direct email. Thank you so much for engaging with us today. And again, thank you to ICCI for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, so with that, I think we, we can close off. And, um, and yes, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for engaging. And, um, and thank you, ICCI, for this, for this platform to share this experience. So thank you so much. Um, and we will see you, hopefully, we will, if anyone has any information again or would like any information, please reach out to me afterwards. I'll stick around for a little bit and happy to pass on Kelly's information. So thank you. Thank you.